So thanks for coming and thanks for supporting the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of America. Uh, and I also want to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to tell you guys a story today. I'm going to tell you a story about you. Uh, the story begins with how you recognize your body versus how your body recognizes you. When you look at yourself, you see one entity, one being. When your body looks at you, it sees a plethora of beings. It sees a multitude of entities. We are multicellular in composition, but we function as one. In order for our body to recognize us, it has to rely on a very intricate yet primitive evolutionarily conserved immune system. That immune system has to distinguish foreign from self. Now we are in a sense a super organism. We are a super organism that consists of bacteria, fungi, archae, uh, protozoa, viruses, and the occasional worm, hopefully not too occasionally. The body has to distinguish those entities from what constitutes self in a way that's quite intricate. Now, the space between us is not devoid of life. And where you end and your neighbor or I begin is very much a gray zone, something I like to call the biological continuum. The immune system has to recognize this biological continuum and integrate it and learn about it as it fights disease and promotes health. Uh, I will start today just some disclosures. I have really no relative, relevant financial affiliations or disclosures. I am sponsoring a CCFA Take Steps team, and I invite you all to participate. My outline is a little ambitious, and I may have to speak through some of it. But I'm going to start by talking about what I know best, and that is gut physiology, about food physiology, the physiology of feeding. And then I'm going to introduce the concept of a microbiome, the superorganism that we are. Uh, we are a complex ecology. And we include the sum total of all the bacteria and all the microorganisms that live on or inside our bodies and how we try to create a homeostatic balance in that ecology. I'm then going to talk about inflammation. What is inflammation? I'm going to try to define it in a way that maybe you haven't heard yet. And I'll talk about a couple of clinical entities that are consequent to a systemic inflammatory response. I'm also going to touch on obesity uh, because I think it's an epidemic that a lot of people are mystified about. And I'm going to tell you about how obesity itself is also related to a systemic inflammatory condition. So certainly all of you would know that a food, a whole food, might be more than the sum of its nutritive parts. Inherently, there's really nothing wrong with corn, wheat, and soy, but when we strip them down to their macro nutrients and put them back together, we oftentimes come up with something like Twinkies. Now while the Twinkies may have the same macronutrient composition as those three ingredients, it probably still is stripped of a lot of the vital micronutrients that really up until the recent uh, decade or so we were not as familiar with. So I'll start with digestion, gut physiology. So the gut lining is really just a single cell layer. And the single cell layer is responsible for recognizing food, digesting it, and actively absorbing it. The passage of nutrients from the lumen into your body is not a passive process. It's an active process. It's an active process that requires energy, requires engagement, recognition, digestion, absorption, and assimilation. The gut lining also turns, up, uh, turns over quite frequently. Every three to four days or so, stem cells that reside in the bottom of the crypt differentiate and migrate up into the villi, into the tip, and slough off. They're responsible for enzymatic, enzymatic digestion, passage of nutrients, and they also function as a barrier against toxins as well as pathogens. So our gut also turns out to be the largest immune organ in our body. About 50% of all the immune cell mass resides in our gut. The function of the immune system is to sample luminal contents 
and to exert a systemic effect. It is drivel, driven, and I'll explain it to you later, how it's driven by environmental entities, environmental pathogens, or environmental stimulation. And it induces a, a concept we call oral tolerance, our ability to tolerate our environment. And what happens in a lot of conditions is that we lose that tolerance, and we start reacting to things that we shouldn't. So the microbiome, again, is the sum collection of all the microbes that are found on or in our bodies. Um, to use some more colloquial terms, in a sense, you aren't really you, or you are more than yourself. Um, you are a colony of creatures. And what we consist of is really a multitude of species of various bacteria. We have probably around 48 species of bacteria in our skin, another 56 in the mouth, 43 in the esophagus, 25 in the stomach in a quite inhabitable environment, probably more than 400 in the colon, and the genitourinary tract as well. So we support a unique ecological niche, or several niches of ecology within our body. And the number of eukaryotic cells and the number of human cells is outnumbered 10 to 1 by these microbial cells. So we really are more than just ourselves. And if you look at the genetic makeup of the microorganisms that are that harbor in our body, it's probably about a hundredfold the genetic material of what our human genetic material is. And the concentration of bacteria really ranges from about a hundred, a hundred uh, colonies per gram in the stomach to up to a billion colonies in, in the colon. So the role of the intestinal microbiota is quite complex, and they're responsible for doing a lot of different things. First, they help us ferment and digest food. They help us assimilate certain minerals and trace metals, and they also help us detoxify certain xenobiotics, such as antibiotics. They also, as I said, harbor the majority of the immune system, the cellular immune system in our body. And they help uh, process antigens for presentation to the immune system. They help us recognize foreign from self. They help stimulate the immune system and train, memory train, the adaptive immune system. The intestinal microbiota also have several byproducts, from vitamins to toxins, digestive enzymes, as well as short-chain fatty acids like butyric acid, acetic acid, and propionic acid. And lastly, the bacteria is integral to maintaining a homeostatic balance of physiologic inflammation, which we need. We need a little bit of inflammation in our gut in order to allow us to repair and to remodel tissue after injury. Without bacteria in the gut, our ability to repair ourselves is impaired. So the way that our body recognizes bacteria is through these very primitive yet in, in, uh, evolutionarily conserved motifs that are sensed by toll-like receptors. This is a recent discovery um, that was published in Science in 1997 that was discovered by uh, a young man from the Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, who escaped before perestroika. It's a very interesting story of how he came and worked with Charles Janeway at Yale. And he and Janeway uh, published this findings uh, in 1997. They're called toll-like receptors because they actually resemble the toll receptors that are found in Drosophila, in fruit flies. And what we find out is that they are conserved throughout species, um, all the way to even plant kingdoms. So these are very, very ancient uh, receptors that sense motifs or patterns in our environment. Another name for them is pattern recognition receptors. And what you see here is that the toll-like receptor on the surface of the cell triggers a very complicated intracellular cascade that leads to the upregulation of NF-kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B, which is a universal transcription factor for inflammation. It enters the nucleus and turns on various genes and turns off others. And it helps regulate inflammation in the body. So this is quite complex, and there's a lot of research on the topic. But really, the bottom line is that inflammation balances on a fulcrum that's controlled through microbial signaling. So microbial signaling is really key in helping us balance repair on the one hand and inflammation on the other, or injury on the other. 
When this balance is tipped one way or another, disease ensues. And what we know is that the symbionts, the symbionts which are good bacteria, well, they help us regulate the immune system. And the pathobiotes, they can trigger inflammation. And this fulcrum rests really on pattern recognition, our ability to recognize patterns or motifs of pathogens within the environment. Well, dysbiosis, what causes it? Dysbiosis really just means bad bacteria or uh, lack of homeostatic balance within our bacterial um, ecology. Well, certainly genetics have a lot to do with it, as does our food. Patterns of colonization, as well as exposures either to uh, chemicals, bacteria, uh, vaccinations, and medications. And the dysbiotic process can both trigger disease and, if repaired, can help us maintain health. Well, what's an example of a dysbiotic disease? The most obvious and the one that you are most familiar with is inflammatory bowel disease, IBD. And in IBD, certainly there are a number of host factors. The barrier function of that single line of epithelium that uh, protects us from the environment. Uh, if there's any disruption in the barrier, that sometimes is enough to trigger an inflammatory response or a, a tip the balance in favor of inflammation. Uh, there's also the immune system, which we will talk about some further. But there are environmental factors, specifically microbes. And if you look at mouse models of IBD, if you keep the, mi the mice germ-free and you try to induce IBD without bacteria, you fail. The moment you add a bacterial species, even if it's lactobacillus or bifidobacterium and things that we think of as being symbiotes or commensals, that can be enough to trigger an inflammatory response. So what we see in IBD is that there's some kind of a physical in, uh, injury or a chemical or a toxin injury that disrupts that single epithelial layer. And both pathogenic bacterial strains that may be present on the lumen, as well as no, normal microbiota, can pass through that epithelial layer, engage our innate immune system, and then, depending on various genetic factors, can cause what we see in IBD, which is a persistent inflammatory state. However, IBD is not just local to the gut, right? About a third of uh, IBD patients will complain of extraintestinal manifestations. And in a re recent paper that was uh, published in Journal of Pediatric Gastronutrition, uh, extraintestinal manifestation rate in a large pediatric cohort study of over 1,000 patients showed that the cumulative probability over four years of developing extraintestinal manifestations is about a third. So IBD is a systemic condition with comorbidities, and as we all know, exposes us to the risk of cancer. And IBD and cancer is not just regular cancer. The cancer in IBD tends to occur at a younger age. It progressive to, uh, progresses to an invasive type more frequently. It has a higher rate of synchronous primary tumors, meaning several tumors can actually arise at the same time. And the histology is unique. Also, the molecular events that lead to cancer in IBD appear to be different from the general population. So all this is consequent to inflammation. Well, how do we define inflammation? If you go back a couple of millennia, you see that inflammation was something that was described in ancient time. In Latin, the most famous way that we oftentimes think of inflammation is rubor et tumor cum calor et dolor. Redness and swelling with heat and pain. Um, Rudolf Virchow in the 1800s added a fifth cardinal sign, which was loss of function. But those four cardinal signs are still things that we think of today. And the immune system is very complex, and sometimes I like to think of them as just kind of like the soldier uh, that's protecting our body, but it contains both an innate system, which is kind of like the cowboy, or maybe not the cowboy, more like the, the, the bad guy in the Wild West, or who shoots first and asks questions later. The innate immune system is designed to respond quickly without really asking too many questions. 
while the adaptive immune system is much more specific and can train itself uh, to remember. And what we see with inflammation is that inflammation can be triggered by infection, tissue injury, or stress. And the end result is an adaptation to the stress or a restoration of the homeostatic balance. But if you fail to reestablish homeostasis, what you get is a reset of the set points and an auto-inflammatory disease. And IBD is not really autoimmune it is, as much as it is auto-inflammatory. So what you see is that some kind of a signal, either an exogenous from the environment or even an endogenous signal, leads to an immune response resulting in tissue remodeling. If you're able to achieve tissue remodeling in a beneficial manner, it leads to healing. But if you fail to achieve healing, then you have a failure to resolve the conflict and you get scarring, organ damage, and cancer. And indeed, this vicious cycle of inflammation and tissue damage is believed to be responsible for a lot of modern diseases, not just IBD, but also fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, and obesity, coronary artery disease or vascular disease, stroke, dementia, and other neurodegenerative diseases, as well as multiple sclerosis, autoimmune conditions such as rheumatoid arthritis, and cancer. So to quote Peter Levy of Harvard, who uh, published this in Nutrition Reviews 2007, the aging of the population, the conquest of many communicable diseases, and changing lifestyles present an epidemic of chronic disease projected to soon extend worldwide. Inflammation provides a unifying pathophysiological mechanism underlying many chronic diseases, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, certain cancers, and bowel diseases, arthritis, and osteoporosis. Ruslan Metzitov, the person I mentioned who discovered toll-like receptors, for which he probably get, will get a Nobel Prize one day for medicine, said this in a recent cell review. In the past few decades, the spectrum of prevailing inflammatory conditions has shifted from acute inflammatory reactions in response to wounds and infections to chronic inflammatory states that accompany, for example, type 2 diabetes, atherosclerosis, asthma, neurodegenerative diseases, and cancer. So I'll start with a couple of examples that I see as a gastroenterologist just to convey this message. One of them is fatty liver disease. We also call it NASH or NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So in general, we like to think of steatosis or fatty infiltration into the liver as something that's quite benign. But something triggers an inflammatory process in the liver that can make it inflamed, can recruit fibrocytes, fibroblasts, lay down collagen matrix, create a fibrotic liver, which leads to cirrhosis and even hepatocellular carcinoma, cancer. And we're starting to see this in children that are younger and younger. In fact, I have a six-year-old who has cirr cirrhosis. I have a 10-year-old who has cirrhosis. And uh, in the adult population, liver transplant for this condition is the, it's a third leading indication, indicator for liver transplant after alcohol and hepatitis C. And we're seeing a rise in the incidence of steatohepatitis. Well, if you ask what causes this liver disease, um, most people will give you the answer that it's a two-hit hypothesis. The first hit being steatosis, or benign fat accumulation in the liver. But the second hit is some kind of an oxidative stress, an oxidative stress response that leads to inflammation. We're not really sure what causes this reactive oxygen species, this ox oxidative stress. But you see that here, the first hit is steatosis. The second hit is steatohepatitis due to some kind of a process, which we believe includes intestinal bacterial products. Further oxidative stress and inflammatory cytokines will lead to fibrosis, and then for some unknown reasons, it can progress all the way to cirrhosis and cancer. Well, at least in this condition, we know for a fact that the initial trigger is food. And even though we don't have any other clear diseases where food is the initial trigger, in this disease, it's clear cut. And food causes a change in our microbiota or may cause a change in our immune system. And this can be mediated through toxins or recognition of the food through pattern recognition receptors, 
through a process called molecular mimicry, which I will show you in just a little bit, or a dysbiotic process that leads to immune activation, and then depending on genetic predisposition, can lead to the production of reactive oxygen species or oxidative stress, tissue damage, and inflammation. Diabetes and metabolic syndrome and obesity as well are a function of immune activation, the activation of serine kinases, which phosphorylate insulin, phosphorylate insulin receptors leading to insulin resistance and thereby stress and obesity. So you may not think you eat a lot of corn and soybeans, but you do. 75% of the vegetable oils in your diet come from soy, and more than half of the sweeteners you consume come from corn. And if there's actually one unifying message that I want you to go home with today, if there's one message that I would like you to try to remember, is that we do not have enough variety in our diet. We think that we're eating, well, this one is a Twinkie vanilla color uh, flavored Twinkie, and this is a chocolate flavored Twinkie, so they must be two different foods, but they're not. And even some of the nutritious foods that you buy at the grocery store that come prepackaged and preserved and refined probably contain a lot of the exact same ingredients that are found in Twinkies. So really, we are a product of corn, soy, and wheat. And we have very little variety. And the question is, how does that confuse our immune system? What is that doing to both directly to our immune system, but also indirectly by changing the bacteria that live within us and crosstalk with the immune system? So there are two ways, both a direct and an indirect way, in which food affects our health. And I'm going to show you some of the data for that. So the first piece of data I'd like to convince you of is that certain forms of food directly engage pattern recognition receptors. This is a process that we call molecular mimicry. Certain components of our food are not recognized as food. They are recognized as bacteria, as pathogens. And they upregulate innate immune responses. That cowboy in the Wild West is shooting first and, ask, and asking questions later. He sees a food product, not sure of what it is, and he starts shooting. The result of the innate immune response is production of oxidative stress. And the lack of the micronutrients in refined food possibly inhibit our ability to neutralize these radicals, these oxi uh, oxidative radicals that incur so much injury. So the first example is with palmitic acid. It's a saturated fatty acid, 16 carbons in length. And you see here that compared to controls, this is lipopolysaccharide or endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, for example. And you see that there, this is bovine serum albumin, which is just a negative control. And here they looked at the constructs as negative controls as well. I want you to focus on the TLR4, toll-like receptor 4. Toll-like receptor 4 is a pattern recognition receptor that seems to recognize palmitic acid and upregulate NF-kappa B, nuclear factor kappa B, which I spoke of before, as being a universal transcription factor for inflammation. In fact, free fatty acids act very similarly to lipopolysaccharide, and with increased concentration will upregulate inflammatory markers or cytokines that a lot of you are probably familiar with, such as tumor necrosis factor alpha. Free fatty acids will not induce inflammation in the absence of toll-like receptor 4. So if you take a transgenic mice and you knock out TLR4, which is possible, you will not get the same upregulation of TNF-alpha or interleukin-6 compared to the wild-type mice. Here you get upregulation in response to free fatty acid, and here much less so, here almost none at all. If you look at the various length of saturated fatty acid chains, um, 12, which is a medium chain triglyceride, versus the longer chain triglycerides, 14, 16, and 18, you see that they are much more pro-inflammatory than some of the monounsaturated, diunsaturated, triunsaturated, and most notably the EPA and DHA, the polyunsaturated omega-3s. Interestingly, if you co-incubate the pro-inflammatory fats with the omega-3 fats, you actually get an abrogation and neutralization of the inflammatory response. So if we just had more variety, if we ate a little bit more fish, ate a little bit more seeds, 
maybe that could abrogate and neutralize some of the pro-inflammatory response of soybean and corn oil. And this is just a table that depicts the saturated fats, monounsaturated, and the polyunsaturated, and gives you their names. One thing I want you to see is how it's, uh, this is a, a cis bond can be, create a trans bond. This is, these are trans fats. This is when you take a monounsaturated fat and actually chemically hydrolyze it in order to make it look like it's saturated. It's even worse than saturated fat and has been shown to be recognized by the immune system as a component of cell wall from bacteria. So these are pro-inflammatory foods, foods that are not really recognized as soul foods but are misrecognized as being pathogens. Another clear example of how products in our food can trigger inflammation is in a condition called parenteral nutrition associated liver disease. Long name for a process that really causes liver disease secondary to nutrition through the vein. So patients that have short gut, patients with Crohn's who've had multiple resections and are unable to tolerate or absorb sufficient nutrients through their gut, they're oftentimes given TPN, total parenteral nutrition, or supplemental parenteral nutrition. Well, we've known about this for a long time, that chronic use of TPN leads to liver disease. But since the 1960s, since we started using TPN, we haven't really been able to figure out why that is, up until now. And only in the last five years or so, there have been a plethora of publications showing that fish oil, instead of soybean oil, in TPN, not only will reverse the damage in the liver, but will prevent it in the first place. So although being used since the 1960s as a source of fat, soybean oil based lipid emulsions lead to serious complications including penile. Data have emerged to show that fish oil based lipid emulsions may be both safe and efficacious in the treatment of penile. And the proof is in the lipid. Mark Pewter is the guy from, Har uh, from Harvard who's been pioneering a lot of this research and has published over 30 papers on it since 2006. And there are several uh, case series that have been reported throughout the world and a couple of randomized controlled trials that are being conducted currently, including right here at UCLA. And just to show you one of their data points from 2008 published in pediatrics is that direct bilirubin, which is a very strong predictor of, of penile, is completely reversed at day zero. Really within eight weeks, you start seeing reversal of the cholestasis of the hyperbilirubinemia. Whereas if you continue with the soybean oil, the direct bilirubin simply continues to rise. So they all had a lead-in period of several weeks, of eight weeks, and then at day, at day zero, the two groups were, um, were further analyzed. One continued on soybean, and one started using the fish oil-based emulsions. So this is as clear as it gets for showing or depicting the pro-inflammatory effects of certain fats versus another. So we see that fat exerts an inflammatory response. They engage pattern recognition receptors. They trigger a false sig uh, invader signal. They activate innate immune defense mechanisms, and they cause disease. Omega-3 fatty acids, on the other hand, are precursors to anti-inflammatory casanoids and leukotrienes. They displace arachidonic acid pathways. And lo and behold, the ratio of omega-6 to omega-3 in the Western diet is probably around 15 to 20 to 1 versus maybe the Paleolithic man 20 or 30,000 years ago had a balance that was much closer to 1 to 1 and compared to the Mediterranean diet, which is probably closer to 4 to 1. So really, we don't have enough variety. We're way too we receive way too much omega-6 fatty acids in our diet, and the question is how do we really get a better balance? So a diet based on quantity rather than quality has ushered a new creature onto the world stage, the human being who manages to be both overfed and undernourished, two characteristics seldom found in the same body in the long natural history of our species. Overfed and undernourished. Too much macro, macronutrients, not enough micronutrients. And this really translates into one of the worst epidemics that our nation is facing, which is obesity. So obesity is defined by various 
modalities. Body mass index is one way to define it. Visceral um, circumference or waist circumference is another. Uh, but if you look at the behavioral risk factor surveillance system who've been tracking obesity rates in the U.S. since 1985, in 1990, no states had prevalence greater than 15%. And in 2008, 32 states had a prevalence of greater than 25%. In fact, currently the only state that has a rate less than 20% is Colorado. And it starts in 1985, and you see most of the states we didn't have the data for. But then slowly data started accumulating, and the rates of obesity started growing. By 1991, we started seeing some of the states in the South uh, assume a, a prevalence of 15 to 19%. And it continued to spread, mostly in the Southeast, but then throughout the US. By 2001, Mississippi had an obesity rate greater than 25%. Other neighboring states started to join. Now we're over 30% in some of those Southeast states. And in 2009, we see 10 states with obesity rates greater than 30%. So it really spread like brush fire, like an epidemic, like an infectious disease. And the message here is that obesity is not just the product of calories in, calories out. I mean, maybe in the end it boils down to that. But it's more than that. And I'm not trying to rewrite the first law of thermodynamics, but obesity is an inflammatory disease. And it's not just how much you eat. It really is also what you eat. Because what we eat is integral to how our immune system functions. So fat functions as a dynamic organ. It produces various cytokines and adipokines that regulate immunity. Fat activates stress response and results in tissue damage as well as systemic disease. There are a lot of comorbid conditions with obesity. So I guess I'm finishing a little early with uh, some conclusions. And I do have one more slide that is a bit more practical. But first, food is vital to normal GI physiology. Food provides sustenance to our microbiome. They eat what we eat. And microbiota are integral to immune health. Food drives both local and systemic inflammation. And I tried to explain the implication of pattern recognition and molecular mimicry in my talk. I think the proof is in the lipid. And we see some proof of how certain fats can upregulate inflammation and other fats can downregulate. The same is true for other components of our food. One is specifically sugar. Sugar tends to be pro-inflammatory and really feeds the wrong bacteria as well. And in obesity, just like uh, PNALD or, or uh, NASH and, and IBD, is an inflammatory condition. And it's not just how much, but really what we eat that matters. So I want to thank you and open the floor for some questions. Um, so thanks for your attention. Yeah. I do, so yeah, variety is really what I'm trying to preach more than anything else. I think you should really try to have variety in your diet. And there are various kinds of plant-based milks that could go along very well with some animal-based milks. But even animal, we're, we consume a lot of cow's milk, and there's goat's milk out there as well that most people kind of cringe at the thought of. Uh, but plant-based milks, like you mentioned, there's almond, there's uh, whole grain, there's coconut, uh, there's soy, and, um, and rice. And I like the rice milk, yeah. Well, the DHA, there are various sources for DHA and EPA. Uh, DHA and EPA are mostly found in fish, but also, uh, but, but, but also algae. So algae has mostly DHA, and it's a nice source of DHA, algae eating just seaweed. Uh, but non-fish non products, uh, such as seeds, will have, have alpha-lipoic acid and alpha-linolenic uh, li acid, ALA. And, and we are actually capable of converting alpha li linolenic acid to EPA and DHA. Uh, however, some individuals are better at converting it than others. What you need to know is that actually consumption of omega-6s and pro-inflammatory um, fats can 
incorporate themselves into the tissue, into the cell membranes, and actually displace some of these omega-3s. So it's really important to consume both omega-3s as well as some of the omega-6s. Balance here is really going to be key. And, and I made this one additional slide because I knew that the most obvious question that I'm going to get is, so what should I eat? I gave you a nice theoretical overview, but here's the practical approach. So the practical, really, uh, the practical approach starts with, with, with food. And in general, we should try to eat as much raw food as we can. Uh, not because uh, cooked food is bad for us, as much as because that seems like we eat too much cooked food or too much preserved or refined food. So incorporating whole, intact food into our diet is going to be of utmost importance. Some individuals with IBD have a hard time tolerating the skin of fruit. So sometimes that fruit has to be peeled. Uh, vegetables are actually much easier to process and digest if they are steamed or boiled. Steaming is healthier because it retains more of the micronutrients and phytonutrients. But incorporating both raw as well as steamed and, um, and baked uh, uh, food into our diet is really important. And, and decrease the amount of fried food that really goes into our diet. But again, balance is key. So uh, I love French fries as much as anyone else. Um, try to avoid additives if you can. And, and that means try not to get stuff that's always packaged or prepackaged, but getting food that actually looks like food. Okay, I'll go through it some more, but go ahead. Well, low residue diet, you know, if you steam vegetables, it would be easier to digest and you may be able to tolerate it better. Now, of course, in Crohn's, you get strictures, okay? So with strictures, it's challenging. And if that stricture is not resected surgically and you're on a low residue diet, um, then it's a challenge. And I would actually advise people that are on low residue diets to try to supplement their diet with some of the enteral formulas, the special enteral formulas. And I'm not a big fan of the, you know, Boost or, or uh, Ensures because they contain just as much corn and soybean and wheat products and and, and casein and whey and all the other stuff that's found everywhere else. So even if you don't believe that there's anything inherently wrong with those food items, which I think is a, is a valid argument, um, I think that balance is going to be key here. And some of the better products um, are out there. There are some new alternative uh, enteral nutrition products out there that use um, rice-based proteins and pea-based proteins. They incorporate uh, seed oils like safflower, sun sunflower. Coconut oil, even though it's rich in saturated fat, is rich in medium-chain triglycerides. Medium-chain triglycerides bypass the lymphatic system in, in their absorption, go straight into the portal system, and there is data to suggest that coconut oil is anti-inflammatory. So I wouldn't advise you consume a lot of coconut oil because it is saturated fat, but again, in balance, it's a very tasty oil, too. Um, the smoke point is quite low, so you can't really fry with it. But for baking, it's great, and, and even just for spooning, it's an amazing treat. It's like ice cream. Um, so then the second part is prebiotics for fiber, and you mentioned residues. So yeah, prebiotics are mostly um, food substances that are not fully digested in our GI tract, and then they feed the good bacteria, the healthy bacteria. And uh, some of these prebiotics are things like inulin and oligosaccharides, fructooligosaccharides, and, and galactooligosaccharides. Uh, and they are found, at, I'll tell you, one rich source of prebiotics is roots. Roots. And, and roots, I bet you, you would be able to process well enough that you could get through most strictures. Um, so parsnip and celery root and yams and sweet potatoes. Um, beets are very healthy for you. They're all very rich in micronutrients and minerals, a lot of trace minerals and trace metals that help the, the, the bone marrow help our uh, hematological status. Uh, but it's important to think of our food as not just something that nourishes our multicellular organism, but also our entire ecology. When you feed yourself, think about the plethora of bacterial species that you are feeding as well. Don't starve them. That's something that sugar does, for example. Sugar is so rapidly broken down and absorbed that it leaves nothing for the bacteria to consume. So really, it starves certain bacterial species. And then, and then another, really, the last point is just, again, balance. And how do you balance macronutrients with micronutrients? Because um, probably most of us consume the majority of our calories from carbohydrates. 
So you have to make sure that those carbohydrates are not just sugar or refined carbohydrates, but they have some substance to them. Uh, the fat source has to be balanced as well. And lastly, the protein source. There's a lot of great sources, plant sources for, for protein, such as nuts and seeds. But tree nuts are a great source of protein. And a lot of people are allergic to nuts, so you have to maybe introduce them slowly and find those nuts that are, uh, I would suggest, unroasted and unsalted. And then you can add a little bit of salt to, to flavor. Pistachios uh, and cashews are two of my favorite. But uh, I recently received some macadamia nuts, and they were splendid, amazing. Um, and then think about the micronutrients and their importance in neutralizing some of the oxidative stress in your body. Uh, oxygen, which is the most vital molecule or you know, compound, atom in our, in our body for life, is also one of the most reactive ones. right? So oxygen is a very reactive uh, species, and it, and it creates it creates reactive oxygen species which can cause damage. So the way to really reduce those oxygen species is through antioxidants such as resveratrol, which has excellent data. Um, resveratrol is found in, in grapes, specifically dark red grapes. So the consumption of resveratrol can help neutralize some of the damage that's done from uh, respiratory damage, uh, respiratory stress in our body. Um, angiogenesis. How many of you know what angiogenesis is? I'm just curious, show of hands. What is angiogenesis, anyone? Or not a lot, okay, angiogenesis, I think this is revolutionary. So there is a guy by the name of William Lee, he just spoke at TED, uh, the technology, entertainment, and media um, convention that occurs every year. And it's an excellent talk, it's about 20 minutes long, and he talks about the prospect of angiogenesis. Angiogenesis is the construction of new blood cells, blood vessels. So, for things like cancer or disease to progress, that cancer has to have a blood supply. It has to have blood delivered to, to, to its core in order for it to spread and, and grow. Angiogenesis, angio is blood, is blood vessel, genesis is the production of. So angiogenesis is the production of new blood vessels in the body. And it turns out that a lot of the phytochemicals and phytonutrients that we've been stripping away from our food and the refining process in order to make those Twinkies are responsible for limiting angiogenesis to tumors. So when you eat whole foods, you're eating not just carbs, fats, and proteins. You're eating phytonutrients, phytochemicals, antioxidants, minerals, vitamins that are so key to maintaining an intact and healthy body. And our Western diet has really shifted from those elements. So I'll take some more questions. Yes, Dr. Shoji. No, the, qu the question was that we need to try to intervene with obesity early. Uh, and really, as a pediatrician, Dr. Shoji mentioned that um, it, it really is an epidemic and we're seeing more and more obesity. And I think the prevalent intervention is um, just eat less. It's okay to go to McDonald's, but make sure you don't eat everything. And I would say, really, McDonald's should be limited. Fast food should be limited. It cannot be the mainstay of our diet. Um, we should cook more at home. When we go out, we should ask what oils they use to cook their food. We should try to balance our, our food with, with, uh, with whole foods, with fruit and vegetables. So if you eat a hamburger, make sure you put as much lettuce, tomatoes, um, and other condiments as possible that are fresh. Um, and instead of fries, get apples. And I think fruit make great dessert. And a vegetable with every meal. And I, I preach that to my kids at every at every chance. Yeah, yeah, more questions, I'm sorry. Let me go to the back, yes. Sugar, the bitter truth. Yeah, Robert Lustig. Oh. Robert Lustig is the, uh, he's in the UCSF and a very, very topic. He talks about it and there was just a recent article in the New York Times, I don't know if you've read it, by Gary Taubes. Gary Taubes a few years ago wrote about fat. What if it's all been a big fat lie? Very interesting article. And he just wrote on 
Friday, yesterday, I think, or maybe Thursday, he wrote an article also at the New York Times where he headlines um, the message by Robert Lustig from UCSF, who I think is the director of the obesity center there. And Robert Lustig is really, he calls sugar poison and, um, and talks about high fructose corn syrup and regular sugar as well, but gives a very convincing argument for why sugar is not good for us. However, I do differ from Robert Lustig in one big, big manner, and that is that I believe that, you know, life without sugar is not as good as life with sugar. So I preach balance, because if I couldn't have ice cream, I would be much less happy. Yeah, yes, sir, let me go to the gentleman here. That's a great question. So the question is whether we need to be aware of mixing foods together. I had a patient the other day, it was the patient's, you know, I'm a pediatrician, so it was the father of the patient, asked me about consuming watermelon by itself. And I actually went to the literature and I wanted to see if there's any data on eating certain foods by themselves. And I think that it really depends on the individual. But gastric emptying, the way that your stomach empties, is not just a bland isotonic emptying of the stomach into the small intestine. It's actually quite calculated. Your stomach can separate nutrients, can compartmentalize a little bit. I mean, we don't have several stomachs like herbivores, but it can compartmentalize. And we know that certain food products like fat is absorbed or emptied into the small intestine much slower than sugar or carbs. And if you eat a high fiber diet, that fiber may also need to have further digestion. The argument for eating foods separately or foods that have different gastric emptying times separately is to prevent fermentation or putrefaction of certain foods in the stomach while it waits to be exiting. So watermelon is very rapidly absorbed or digested. So the argument is that you shouldn't eat that with other foods that would delay its exit from the stomach because then it would undergo fermentation and you may feel the effects such as bloating. Now, my answer is if you eat watermelon or other, other foods and you don't feel bloating, I think it's probably okay. But listen to your body, because if you do get bloated or if you do feel like you're gassy, gas is not a product of ingesting or, or inhaling air. Most of that comes back up as, as a burp. Most of the gas in our body is produced by bacterial fermentation of food. So if you feel bloated, if you feel gassy, ask, how did I eat, what did I eat, what kind of combination? But that's a very important point. Thank you. One la one. Okay, I'm sorry, we're going to let people in for lunch. I apologize. Thank you. I'll stick around for more questions. So thanks again for your attention.